New Zealand has released its long-awaited National Artificial Intelligence Strategy, ending its status as the last OECD country without one. Launched by Science, Innovation and Technology Minister Shane Reti late yesterday afternoon, the 20-page document, uh, not very big, is it? 20 pages? Anyway, it's 20 pages. Uh, it promotes a light-touch regulatory approach aimed at encouraging AI adoption and investment. While the strategy highlights the potential for AI to add $76 billion to GDP by 2038, critics say it lacks timelines, funding and concrete actions. The government has opted not to introduce new AI-specific laws, instead relying on existing regulations around privacy, consumer protection and human rights. Now, the reaction to this has been mixed. The Auckland Business Chamber welcomed the move for giving, they say, clarity and confidence to companies, especially small to medium enterprise. But AI Forum New Zealand's chief, former chief executive, um, Ben Reid, dismissed it as more of a, a vibe than a strategy, calling it vague and outdated. He warned that relying heavily on overseas AI products risks weakening New Zealand's own tech capabilities and funneling profits offshore. The Council of Trade Unions has also criticised a plan for ignoring the impact of AI on workers and repeating corporate talking points from tech giants like Microsoft. The government, though, has pointed to increased STEM educational investment, that's science, technology, education and maths projects, and free online tutorials from big tech firms, but with no funding announcements and implementation years away, Many stakeholders see the strategy as more of a foundation than a finished project. Dr. Simon McCullum is a senior lecturer in software engineering at Victoria University, and he joins me now. Um, Simon, good afternoon. Morning. See, I fell already. <laughs> I do this every time when I do the morning show. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. Um, look, we finally have a national strategy, AI strategy on the table. Uh, do we need one? Well, um, we, we certainly needed one, um, and we needed one about two years ago. Um, <laughs> and, and people may have noticed me kind of um, being, being loud and saying, look, AI is coming and we need to, to start thinking about this. Uh, and this the strategy document would have been fine about two years ago. Yeah. And that's what I thought, actually, at 20 pages, and it's been called more of a vibe than a strategy. From your perspective, what are the biggest risks if we don't take a more in-depth, structured or proactive approach to AI as a country? I, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head with proactive. Um, it's that this document looks at AI as it is, well, as, as it was at the beginning of this year, not looking at what AI is becoming, not what's about to hit us in terms of the agentic AIs that are coming, the, um, the AIs that are used to make phone calls and are used to, to do actions for people uh, and will, will take over some of those activities. Uh, it doesn't address the issue for our graduates because one of the things we're starting to see is that it's really hard for, like, for graduates to start getting jobs now because the AI can do the simple parts of work and so companies can use them to do what interns used to have to do. Um, and so we're going to open up a gap in employment for young people. Uh, it doesn't address any of those kind of what are what are the new skills required for young people to be able to enter a productive workforce. Um, yeah, it, it, it looks kind of backwards and says, well, if the AI stays the same as it is right now, what would we have to do rather than mm -hmm. saying, well, what is what's coming? Yeah, and it's it's interesting you you mentioned you know about um, university students leaving already and 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 the jobs that maybe they might have gone for or or they're not uh, not so many in the industry are hiring because AI has taken you know a cut of of that industry and, and it's working instead of a person and that was the concern um, of the Council of Trade Unions that they said the government was ignoring this impact. Um, I mean, AI is already replacing people in some jobs, isn't it? Well, I think um, how you need to think about it is more than, um, it's not so much that AI is replacing a person, it's that AI can make a person more productive. 
right? So if if trained well, right, and this is something we're also seeing uh, internationally, is if you dump AI into a company and just say, hey, here's the AI, start using it. Mm. Mostly those companies don't actually see much of an improvement. It's only when you give them the tool and training to use it well, that's mm. when you see the productivity improvement. And it's not so much that you take a person and replace them, it's that you make each of your employees 20% more productive. And so you just don't have to hire a new person and you can get more work in and yeah. do more work without having to hire new people. So it's not so much that you are explicitly replacing a person, it's that you don't need to hire new people and you can get right. more work done. Yeah, right, got it. Um, the tech companies raised concerns about becoming over-reliant on offshore AI products. How important it to us should it be that we develop our own solutions, our AI solutions? Yeah, so there's a move for for what's called sort of digital sovereignty, right, or yep. AI sovereignty. Uh, and and I've been um, talking to various companies in New Zealand. So Catalyst does does some work in the space. There's T4, which is opening up data warehouses across the country, so that we can run models locally, and that we can actually have the infrastructure within New Zealand to do that. Um, so there certainly has been a discussion down in Chicago about you know instead of having TY Point selling electricity by making aluminium, maybe we should use that electricity to do AI infrastructure. Um, and because that's the main cost for the AI systems is electricity. And we've got green electricity. So we are ideally positioned to, to move into ho hosting AI infrastructure. But the risk is that if you have it hosted overseas or processed overseas, mm. then if there is an international disagreement between your country and the country where all your data is and all your systems are, mm. and you lose access to that, suddenly you're crippled. Um, yeah. And and there is a, a kind of an insurance risk, right? It's the, while everything's fine, it's mm. okay. It's just, if yeah. something goes wrong, how how screwed are you? <laughs> this is, um, and, and that's the, what we kind of need want, want to look at avoiding. And so I think we need to be investing in hosting AI infrastructure, hosting data centers, and then we can do things like make sure they're green, make sure that they're not adding carbon footprints or using massive amount of fresh water. We can do all those things if we're hosting it here. But if we don't, we're relying on other countries, A, mm. to, to do it ethically, and B, that we're always going to have friendly relationships with everybody who has a, a data center that we're, we're using. And, of, and, you know, and ultimately they've got the control as well. So other countries are investing billions into AI and, and not just the tech itself, but, you know, regulation, research, education. So what you've just explained, we are, we, even though we've got this 20 page strategy, without extra funding, um, we're not really going anywhere. And and if the government had, had been, you know, slightly willing to sort of look slightly sideways, um, mm. it could have looked into the um, <clears throat> the investment in defence spending and said, well, actually, AI infrastructure and, and AI and warfare is going to become one of the critical aspects of future um, yeah, wars and, and um, conflicts. And so you could actually say, well, we're investing in sovereign AI infrastructure mm. as part of our defence spending. So they've got they've, they've allocated a whole bunch of money, and I tell you what, having having local AI infrastructure is probably going to be a lot more valuable than having an extra frigate, mm -hmm. right? Because there'll be a, a sea drone that'll that'll blow it up and sink it, <laughs> and yeah. and so yeah, we we need to to be investing. Um, I also feel in the education space we are not investing in in upskilling our small and medium businesses. I know I've, I've yeah. been doing workshops for government, I've, I've done workshops for um, Business South, I've been trying to talk to people about AI for the last few years, um, yeah. given, you know, I've, I've been in this space for 30 years, right? So I've, I've people have finally realised that, hey, AI, it's a thing. Um, yeah, it's but a thing. we just, yep. yeah, there's just no money and there's like, there's not the investment in professional development across teaching to say, well, it's not just about math, reading and writing. We actually need to increase the technological skill of all of our teachers, but there's just yes. not the investment. 
You know, Simon, I, that's an interesting fact that you brought that up because a recent survey, I think uh, it was done by Spark, um, said that 68% of SMEs, you know, your, your small, medium enterprise businesses, had no plans to evaluate or invest in artificial intelligence, 68%. You've just brought that up. You know, you've been trying to talk to them about it. Or do you think because, not just the investment, the money side of it, like many of us, Simon, we just don't understand AI or or what it can do. 